I was fuming mad as I marched into a meeting I'd called in the big conference room as a 30-something engineering manager at a dot-com. And before even sitting down, I yelled, this is bullshit. I didn't actually say shirt. I was living with bipolar two disorder, severely depressed and deep into year five of drug addiction. And I was sure that I wasn't the one with a problem. But I noticed my coworkers started liking me less and less, and that hurt. So back in my early 20s, I was generally pretty popular at work, even though I was secretly super arrogant. And when I say secretly, I mean so secretly that even I didn't know I was arrogant. <laughs> I just thought I was better than everybody else. I didn't suspect I had a mental illness, even though I'd threatened to kill myself when I was eight and I'd once walked into a hardware store, a hardware store to buy poison to end my pain. I don't think I was serious about it because as I walked the brightly lit aisles perusing the various hazardous chemicals, I started to worry that they would taste bad. Like, I have a sweet tooth. I wasn't gonna drink Drano. And I obviously couldn't ask the staff which weed killer was the most delicious. What are they gonna say? Yeah, I recommend Weed Be Gone, pumpkin spice flavor. As I progressed through my 20s, my highs and lows got wilder and wilder, and I tried to compensate with hard drugs, which, by the way, uh, if you're thinking of trying that, I've done the testing for you, it doesn't work. Like, if I had bought them on Amazon, I would have given them one star review. <laughs> and then I was actually surprised when I couldn't quit, like, what? <laughs> I overdosed. And I'm only alive because the person I was with knew to give me mouth to mouth until paramedics arrived with Narcan. In my early 30s, I received my first invitation to stay in a hospital's locked behavioral health unit on suicide watch. Well, I thought it was an invitation. It turned out they weren't asking. I was processed into the unit and I asked one of the admin staff to call my boss. Uh, at this bank where I worked in IT to tell him that uh, because we were doing this project rollout and I wanted, <clears throat> I told her to tell him to delay it because I couldn't be on site to support it. And she never made the call because she thought I was just delusionally imagining that I had a computer job at a bank. This was the late 90s. I think today, if you show up in a psych ward and say you work in technology, they'll believe you. Mm -hmm. Every story I'd ever heard about depression, <clears throat> uh, about people who needed treatment for depression, they'd ended up judged lonely and miserable. So when I was released, I didn't get treatment because depression has a branding problem, right? No company would ever talk about their product the way our society talks about depression and treatment can you imagine the head of marketing for a car company saying like, okay, here's the marketing strategy for our new car model. We're gonna call it the disorder. And our ads will show sad people driving alone aimlessly while an out of tune piano plays REMs, everybody hurts. <laughs> and the camera will zoom in on the GPS and the destination will read, why even bother? And then the announcer will say, the disorder, the car you'll want to hide because it makes other people uncomfortable. <laughs> Without treatment, I kept getting worse. A couple years later, I took that dot-com job I mentioned where everybody had a problem except me. Over the next several years, I lost everything and <clears throat> I got a second invitation to stay in a hospital's locked behavioral health unit. But this time, something amazing happened. I was, one night after dinner, I was sitting in this uh, sterile TV slash dining area with one other patient. There was a calming honesty in the air, the, the comfort of not having to hide who you are. 
And she told me what was going on in her life and inside her as she drove her Jeep to the edge of the Grand Canyon and sat there revving the engine, why she didn't drive over and what she might do next in her life. Uh, I told her about my attempt, which didn't involve any of the world's seven natural wonders. That simple human bonding made me feel like I was already awesome just being exactly who I was. And it felt so good that I started asking other patients for their stories. And I saw that they were kind, smart, humble people with this amazing inner strength. Going in there, I had never felt more alone or broken or like a freak. And after those connecting, comfortable conversations, I'd never felt more like I belonged in the world. I went back to work in technology with total humility because I didn't even know if I could keep a good job. Instead of desperately grasping for chances to outshine coworkers, I tried to figure out what they needed for their interactions with me to be more pleasant. Uh, I checked myself into treatment for addiction. And the heart of 12-step meetings is just <clears throat> stories, raw stories from people on the edge, trying to, just trying to fight for survival, and then other people who've been there talking about how they got clean. Well, when I had two years clean, I was still super depressed and kind of pissed off about it. I was like, recovery is a ripoff. Where the hell is my freaking inner peace and my goddamn effervescent joy? <laughs> but other people in recovery told me that they had passed through the same thing, and it gave me hope. Instead of drowning in negative thoughts, like I had done my whole life, I started saying to myself, Bill, this is your situation, right, wrong, fair, unfair, your fault, not your fault, irrelevant. What are you gonna do about it? Well, I talked to my doctor and <clears throat> uh, he, put me on, he put me on antidepressants and I insisted I would only do three months and he said, yeah, well, we have kind of a rule of thumb, which is don't go off antidepressants in Seattle in the winter. <laughs> I took his advice and later did a course of therapy. I also put a lot of my own time and energy into mindfulness, kind of putting a, a cushion between me and my thoughts and feelings. Uh, I meditated badly, like I drank coffee while meditating. <laughs> I still do that, but I did finally make a rule, no Facebooking. <laughs> so my doctor had also given me some sleeping pills for insomnia, but after I was sleeping well again, I kept refilling the prescription and hoarding the pills because even though I was feeling good, all my life I had fantasized about having a suicide kit just to keep at the ready. And <clears throat> when I finally, uh, when I finally had all the, <clears throat> enough, right? When I put them all in one bottle and uh, I held it up like it was some kind of holy grail that I'd been questing for and I stared at it and I thought, my timing sucks. I'm happy now. <laughs> the darkness that I had lived in since childhood had been lit in the fire of other people's stories. The future had always looked so bleak to me that I'd been afraid to have kids or even a plant But a few months after I threw those pills out, the darkness was still gone and I thought, holy crap, I could get kittens. <laughs> and my cats turned seven this year. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you know, I have 11 years clean now, and I've lost over 100 pounds, and I, <laughs> I didn't need applause for that. Uh, I overcame social anxiety. I work in marketing now, which is a total people skills job. And if there's one thing I've learned by surviving uh, a suicide attempt, or a couple suicide attempts and a drug overdose, it's that looking for ways that I'm the same as other people makes me so much happier than looking for ways that I'm different. And that's why tonight is so special. I've been sneaking into the corridor watching the storytellers and everybody has been so amazing tonight that it's just, uh, it's like a dream come true for me. So thank you, all of you, and to our co my co-director, Susan Fee, who's here tonight too. So that's why I'm rebranding depression. And I invite you to join me. A friendly conversation or even just a smile can change somebody's life. Let's make talking about behavioral health issues so much fun that people who've been happy and well-adjusted all their lives will feel like they're missing out. <laughs> Let's be the fire that lights somebody else's darkness. Thank you.